We've got a great way to end your Thursday here at Climate Week because we've been talking about storytelling and who doesn't love a story? So in a moment, I'm going to show a video and then I'll make a few opening remarks and I've got a fantastic panel who's going to come up and join us for this most important issue. And how many times has story been mentioned in so many other platforms, in so many other panels throughout all of Climate Week? It feels like story is sort of like the last little bit of the pie. Now, Solutions House is actually Futera's offices during the week. So this is a working space which we've converted. And thank you so very much to the Futerans who have allowed us to take their space this week and work from home. Um, but it's also a working space, which means you're going to have pings from elevators and people coming in and out because that's what happens when you're holding an event in an office space. Now, Solutions House is co-convened by Futera. Um, I'm, their, I'm Solitaire Townsend. I'm their chief solutionist and co-founder of Futera by the Exponential Roadmap and by Google. And the motto of Solutions House is answers only. Because now in 2022, we should look at the problem for only so long as it takes to actually come up with solutions. Now, answers only also happens to be the Wi-Fi password. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we know about behavior change. That's how you embed it. So if you take a look for Solutions House, then you can put answers only, capital A, capital O, all one word to get onto our Wi-Fi. And please do tweet out and share out um, anything that you hear today that inspires uh, enrages, uh, uh, fascinates you. That's what's been happening all week. Um, uh, just, a, just a word on housekeeping. We're not expecting any fire alarm. Um, so if you do hear alarm, there's an exit just here by the, um, uh, uh, the stairs and then one at the back. Please don't <coughs> take the lifts. So I'm going to open with a video, which is a little story that Futera has put together about our mission and then I'll uh, make some opening remarks before we start the panel proper. Welcome. You are now entering the Anthropocene. That's a long word for short attention spans. Put simply, it's the human age. You human beings are having such an impact on the planet, you've got a whole geological era named after you. The people who invented smartphones, and spaceships, and architecture, and language, toilets, art, science, education, and dancing, and power, and plastic, and whatever that is, and dancing, and deforestation, exclusion, pollution, and poverty, and climate change. The Anthropocene is us, all of us, a species whose DNA is made of mistakes and miracles. Sure, we made the problems, but we are the solution. And you, you're the answer, one of the dreamers and shapers, builders and makers, someone with the power to make the Anthropocene awesome. This is your future, so choose your own adventure. Remember, folks, if you want to dodge an apocalypse, then you better aim for awesome. And I love the fact that a little bit of uh, Futella advertising popped up there yeah. on the screen at, at, at the end. So um, the Anthropocene is a very, very terrible word for the human age, the age of humans. And what are humans? We're nothing except great apes. We're miracles and, and we're problems. Uh, but one of the theories which has been put forward about what makes human beings special is stories, that we're homo narrativium, the storytelling ape. And so stories are so central to who we are that human beings believe stories more than we believe facts. Now, when I say that to a bunch of climate scientists, they get really pissed off because, no, we are facts-based. And I say, no, actually, even scientists believe stories more than they believe facts. So imagine you've done the research on buying a new car. You've looked online, you've looked at the fuel efficiency, you've looked at the safety stats, you've compared the money, you've made your decision that you're going to buy this particular car. 
And then you're at work and you're talking to someone you don't even get on with that much. And they say, no, oh no, you can't buy that car. My brother-in-law, he had one of those. They're a nightmare. You can't believe the advertising, the fuel efficiency is awful. He ended up having to get rid of it. The depreciation was terrible. What neuroscience would tell us is even though you made a fact-based decision, you will not buy that car nor would a scientist who went through the same process. We believe stories more than we believe facts. In fact, stories are remembered 20 times more than facts are. We have to engage our executive processing to remember a fact, a date, a number, a, a percentage. But actually, stories are remembered by a different part of our brain because we are programmed since birth with stories. We don't teach our children facts and stats. We teach them fairy tales. That's how human beings are made. And stories are everywhere. They actually make up 65% of our conversations. Again, that feels like unlikely, particularly here in Climate Week when we've been talking about these big issues. But when we get together, we tell each other stories. Oh, oh I saw that guy and he said this and she said that about so-and-so. And did you hear that this happened? And oh, wow, did you see the funeral? Like, it's, we, t we talk to each other in stories. So stories are everywhere which is wonderful and terrible for climate change because it means we have an unused tool or at least an underused tool for change. And in fact, um, Anna will be talking, to, talking about the work that, 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 that she's been doing to change that story. But I, I will admit to being a bit worried about what the understory of climate change is at the moment, what the meta-narrative is. Because when I spend time online, particularly looking at memes and YouTubes, particularly looking at how people are talking to each other about climate change, the understory of climate change that I see is Frankenstein. Man makes monster, monster destroys man. It's a morality tale, and you almost see a satisfaction of the narrative completion of through our hubris, we created this monster, and now this monster is going to, to destroy us. Although it's terrifying, anxiety-inducing, there's a narrative satisfaction to fulfilling this story that we're programmed with. It's the Gollum story of Judaic um, tradition. It's Godzilla. This story is a very, very familiar story to us. And that is why, because stories can become self-fulfilling prophecies. We all told ourselves stories when we were children about what we would become. We told ourselves stories about who would we marry. We told our stories about the jobs that we would have. And actually, we tend to put a great deal of work into fulfilling those stories, whether we know that we're doing so or not. So what might be the alternative story? That's something which we're going to talk about here. And I took a look at the, um, you know, the seven basic plots uh, and thinking about actually how so many of those plots could make a brilliant story. Now, the most obvious one is the overcoming the monster story. Now, this is a very, very, very um, familiar plot. It's part of, you know, it's David and Goliath. It's part of uh, many, many, many stories where everything seems to be going wrong, when the chips are down, when you've got a small group of heroes, an unlikely found family who managed to go up against this great challenge. And through actually guile and luck, not usually through heroism. When you actually think even about uh, Marvel superhero stories and even about James Bond, quite often the heroes trick their way into, into solving the problem. You manage to actually overcome the monster. And in many ways, we have those tricks. We have that guile. We have renewable energy, the way for us to trick our way out of climate change. Another very familiar story is Rebirth. The Frog Prince, Pride and Prejudice, A Christmas Carol, where through great trials and challenges, somebody goes through a, a sense of self-awareness and comes through to a different sense of who they are and the role they want to take in the, in the world, usually a better role. And that is a story that many people are trying to bring us to, the sense that humanity has gone off path, that we, that we need to think differently about who we are and change our values. Again, it's an actual plot which we can carry around in our head. But my favourite is actually the quest story, you know, the, uh, the, 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 um, the Lord of the Rings. They're having something which you, a quest, something which you've got to fulfil, you've got to go and find and create and make. And in fact, I often think about Sam and Frodo when they're in Mordor and Sam talks about how much he used to love reading stories and how much story of adventures and Lothlorien and all these wonderful stories that he read and actually how awful it is to actually be in the story. 
And he says, we're now at the darkest point of the story. This is the moment when I used to say, Dad, can we close the book now? I don't want to read anymore. And this is, this is where we are. And actually what Tolkien, um, who of course went through the experience of war, was telling us with Lord of the Rings is that actually we are in a story. And when you're in the story, you have to have a quest as something which you're trying to achieve. And that the story itself, the adventure itself, is the interesting bit. Like, honestly, at, at, you know, at Jane Austen never tells you the story of the marriage mm -hmm. and actually how they lived and how they raised children. That actually, the happy ending is a bit boring. Maybe the vision that we're trying to come up with for sustainability is great, but it's a bit boring. The story is the adventure of how we get there the challenges we have to overcome, the unlikely allies we're going to be pulling together, the setbacks, the thousand to one um, uh, chances. So let's reframe from the Frankenstein story and perhaps to one of the many other plots that there are, the adventure stories, but perhaps there's one of those seven basic plots that we really don't want to have anymore, and it's the one where we all fucking die at the end. Which we keep telling them. Um, so, um, uh, with, with, I would very much like at that point, sorry, apologies, it's, it's cute when British people swear. Um, uh, with that point, I would love to um, ask uh, Anna Jane, join the founder of the Good Energy Stories, to come up and to join me. And Anna, if you, if you would join me, join me here. And I would also love um, uh, Adana Steinacker. Did I do it? Okay, Adana, if you would come up and join me here. And I'm just going to check. I'm going to put a call out into the room about whether Christy has actually managed to join us as yet. It would be so cool if that was her stepping through. Right, right then, that would literally look like we'd set up the story. Christy um, uh, is from Brown Gold Green. She's the co-founder of the Green Jobs Board, and she's a massive YouTuber who I'm really hoping might, might be able to join us. And we'll welcome her um, uh, when she comes. And I, with this wonderful panel, what I actually asked them to start with would be a story and the story of them. Because so often, uh, all we are are job titles, and that's what we come to represent at these sessions. But and then I want to know who you are. So if there was a movie of your life, please feel free to mention who would play you. But if there was a movie of, of your life, and in that opening montage... Ooh. Oops. Did not expect that. <laughs> Let's just double check. Is it okay? I think it's okay. I'm going to put this just, I'm going to slip this in your pocket if that's okay. There yeah, we go. That's fine, thank you. Um, uh, and if there was a story of your life and in that opening montage, what would be some of the things which we would see to understand who Adana is? Okay, first of all, um, it's my pleasure to be here and lovely to meet you. Thank you for having me. Um, then the next thing I would say, if there was a movie about my life, I would love to play myself. <laughs> Anyone I don't listening? think anybody yeah. else would do a great job. Um, so my name is Dr. Adana Steinaka. Um, before I became a doctor, um, I was this little girl that was born in Nigeria and was very, very close to my grandmother in particular. She was a great storyteller. So she took me back to the days of Biafra and all of the beautiful things as well that happened in Nigeria back in the day. And so that closeness and that bond um, meant that I was hurt particularly when she started to get older and sicker and eventually when she passed away. But in that time, I just thought, I mean, I want to help her and how can I do it? And I grew up with this in the back of my mind. Why can't I understand what's wrong with grandma? And I will find all the solution when I'm older. And that's what led me to the path of medicine. Because I thought, you know, that's the only way I could get answers of what was wrong with grandma. And I could make sure that my parents don't have to go through the same thing. And so I studied medicine. I moved to the UK. That's where I met my German husband. So I was this Nigerian girl who went to the UK and met a German man and then we moved to Ireland mm -hmm. and we had three beautiful children. <laughs> and so in the, over the years I've carried on my career as a as a medical doctor and as a YouTuber, um, which is one of the reasons I'm here. So thank you YouTube for inviting me. And yeah, so th this is my story where I am at this intersection between medicine and social media and how we could use storytelling to make sure that the 
it's not just, we're not providing solutions, but we could actually convince the people who need it through storytelling and through the use of digital platforms like YouTube. So that is my story. I don't know, what a beautiful story. Thank you so very much. Thank I honor you. your grandmother for you being here. Thank you. Anna Jane, your story. Yeah, um, it's quite dramatic. Um, my dad, um, I was, my dad is a evangelical megachurch pastor. He's very conservative. He's a big Trumper. So that was the environment I was raised in. And I left the church when I was like 15 or 16 and decided that I didn't know what happened in the next life, but I really love this life and I really love this earth and I wanted to experience it and be very present. And um, that led in college to me becoming an environmentalist. And it was very much a love story, you know, reconnecting with something that was bigger than myself. And that led to my career. And a lot of my early career was um, organizing faith communities. And now I work with screenwriters. And people often ask, how did you go from organizing faith communities <laughs> to working with screenwriters? But it's, uh, I see a direct through line in that religion is just a set of stories. And I got really good at using stories to inspire different kinds of audiences. And that has uh, really informed my entire you know, work and being, I, so I've been in the climate space my entire career and um, early on could see that storytelling and communications were a really big gap for the climate world for many of the reasons that you spoke to earlier and have just can kind of continued to go more and more in that direction throughout my career. Um, I've, you know, worked, I've been in documentaries, I've produced documentaries. Um, and now I work with screenwriters to integrate climate change into scripted television and film. Beautiful. So thank you so very much for that. Um, and again, thank you for your journey as well. It sounds like that was an incredible journey. And I think in many ways, we just demonstrated the most important thing about story, which is people and character. Um, and so often when I talk to corporates or governments about story, um, it's all sort of plot and structure, and it's never about people. But of course, every every great story has always had uh, the human mm -hmm. at the heart. So I'm going to I'm going to come to you, and, and about the power, particularly of YouTube. So you and I t tomorrow will be together talking about the, the power of um, YouTube to tell stories. But there's a big difference between storytelling in YouTube and storytelling in scripted content. Mm -hmm. With scripted content, there's a, there's a great deal of thought in advance and, and it, it can take months or even years to bring something in YouTube. It's intimate, it's daily, it's people talking to you. So um, uh, how, how do you approach storytelling in the work that you do through YouTube? So um, I'll give you my experience on the platform. So I've been on YouTube now for about... Um, for almost nine years, so almost a decade. And when I started, it was this accidental start that became intentional. But because I had started at the time that I was in medical school, I thought the best use of the platform was to talk about or to show my journey in medical school. And I started with, again, facts, right? Um, these are the five things you need to do to be able to get into medical school. And these are the things you need to do in the first year to not get kicked out of medical school. <laughs> and I, so we kept, I kept going with that. And at the time, um, there was no such thing as the influencer industry. So people yeah. who were on the platform at the time, people who were on YouTube, genuinely valued the power of community. We wanted to build our community and we wanted to get to know people who were all over the world. So we, I didn't have this insight of what a good content was or yeah. how people would receive the content that I was doing. So I would get a few thousand views here and there, you know, on the content that I was doing. And it wasn't until I then got engaged, you know, to my, my well, boyfriend who I relocated from England to Ireland with. So I got engaged and when I started to document the story of myself and my husband, yeah. we were getting millions of views, yeah. right? Millions. It, people wanted to know about the engagement and the relationship and the tradition, right? How, you know, how our, our family is going to, you know, perceive the union of this German and this Nigerian. So, and then when I realized that, oh, this is the kind of content that got people interested, um, I started to, I wanted to find the sweet spot between 
bringing people factual information, and but also not in a in a very strict and boring way. Mm -hmm. So then I I then changed because this I, again I started as the medical school series, which is what I was doing, and I was able to then understand that no it, it, it would go beyond just sitting down speaking to the camera about the five points and turning off the camera it included me taking my camera along saying okay actually this is what I'm I'm going to my lecture now and I have an app to me today and I'm going yeah. here and people wanted to see how my story translated to my real life they didn't want that it wasn't that they didn't want that disconnect yeah you know this is what you need to do to stay in med school but this is how you do it and this is how I'm doing it, so that you're inspired by what I'm doing. Yeah. And so that was when I found the sweet spot between just giving people factual information and actually making it more relatable and inspiring them to perhaps do something similar. Yeah. And yeah, so that's how, that, that's the way that I've learned to combine storytelling with factual information. And that has worked for me on, on YouTube particularly. Thank you so very much. And I hope everybody noticed how she just wove in a whole load of facts about how to tell stories <laughs> in a story about how she learned how to tell stories. <laughs> so this was a masterclass <laughs> in including facts and stories. And, uh, and so much of this um, is, is absolutely uh, 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 so very true and also so very difficult within the climate movement where there's a suspicion of storytelling as if storytelling means lying as if storytelling means manipulating as if storytelling means somehow betraying the the truth at climate of climate um, and so sometimes we get a lot of pushback when we talk about storytelling in climate change and so you know and jane the work that you've been doing with scripted content um, and, and, and building that in. How are the storytellers relating to climate change? And also, do you ever get any pushback from the climate people about story? It's a great question. I mean, I think uh, one of our advisors is Dr. Angus Fletcher, who's a story scientist, which yes. I didn't even know existed before I started working on this. But he studies how different stories evoke different emotions, how different story structures evoke different emotions. Mm -hmm. And that is the great power of story, is mm -hmm. that um, you can sit up here and watch a PowerPoint of the latest science, but if it's not wrapped within a story, you're either going to internalize it through a story you already have, or you're just going to glaze over. Yeah. And what he says is that you know there's this kind of common, um, you know, thinking that storytelling is the best form of communications, and he actually says that's false. Storytelling is how our, our brains are story machines. We don't receive information unless it's within a story. Um, so it's critical and it's, it has been so overlooked by the climate movement. And I say that with a lot of love. I've been in the climate movement my entire for 15 years now, but it's often seen as this kind of frou-frou thing that's nice to have. Um, and it's not been invested in, you know, it is, it blows my mind that it is 2022 and we are just now investing in engaging with, you know, scripted entertainment and TV and film. Yeah. Um, because that is, you know, Hollywood is the most powerful yeah. storytellers in the world, arguably other than religion. <laughs> That's, yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, it is, it's unfortunate and it's something I'm definitely trying to change because there is, you know, I, 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 bef way before I was a climate activist, when I was a little, little girl, it was stories that drove me, yeah. you know, it was books that, um, helped me escape the oppressive nature of being raised evangelical. Um, it was, yeah, so it, they've transformed my life and um, and I think that working with some of screenwriters who are the best storytellers in the world to really get to the heart and, and evoke emotions around climate change it's such an honor and and definitely something the climate movement needs to do a lot more of a hundred percent agree so um, it, in fact, actually it's so interesting because uh, 15 years ago I tried to do this mm. so I pulled together Disney and Sony and NBC and the BBC and a project called Broadcasting Green to talk about how we could put climate in the story mm. but it couldn't go forward because it 
it was so very controversial. Mm. And there was this obvious understanding that the power of story would somehow be um, manipulating to people. And in fact, there was, a, there was a news story that was about to come out in the UK about climate spin doctors try to put climate change into children's programming. Mm -hmm. And thankfully, it was from a newspaper called The News of the World that went bust that week when it was due to come out. But this is, this is what fascinates me so much, is that somehow uh, the climate movement can sometimes not recognise the power of story, but those who are against action on climate change understand the power of story so very strongly mm. that they killed this project 15 years ago from going ahead. So that's one of the things which I think we need to understand, that we are dealing with something that is incredibly powerful. As you said, it is human beings are. It's not that, it's not that storytelling, it's the, it's the only thing that, that, that we listen to. Mm. So Adana, coming to you, this is enormous power that you carry. So um, let's talk about that for a moment. So if people were so scared of storytelling 15 years ago that they wanted to stop, how do you deal with the responsibility of being a storyteller and making sure that with these millions of people that are watching you, that you are actually using your power for, you know, with great power comes great responsibility. Of course, yeah. <laughs> so they, to whom much is given, much is expected. Yeah. Yes. Um, so what was your actual question? So how, so, <laughs> so, so how do you make decisions about uh, what you're going to, to do in your YouTube channel to make sure that you're being honest, uh, forthright, and that you, particularly when you are sharing facts and data that those are accurate? Yeah, so this might be a very boring response because genuinely it, it's not complicated for me to think to just do what I already do. Again, maybe because it's usually not scripted, like a, a vlog style video is really the honesty of my life and what I'm doing. Like the camera is on. Of course, I mean, there will be parts of the, at the end of the day, I will edit out some parts of the video. Maybe one that shows a sign where I live or something like that. But as far as what I say or what I'm going through or what I'm doing, um, it's, it's the honesty that people connect to. It's the actual everyday life that they see. So it's not so complicated to be you. Right. You know, if you just, if you just share what you're doing in that time, it, it's not that difficult. So for me, I've not, I've not struggled um, with anything else. Um, if anything, I understood the power very early on because right. genuinely, like if you go on my YouTube channel, the earliest video is where the medical school series where I just sat down and talked to the camera about the five facts I've probably researched and yeah. interwoven some of my stories and then, you know, dished it out at people. So I'm talking at them. Whereas, um, you know, if I when I flipped it, where I'm genuinely saying come with me come along with me to get you know you know to get like an insider view of what i do on a daily basis that's what people people connect to yeah. you know i love that so if you weren't being honest it wouldn't work anyway it wouldn't i mean you can't you couldn't it wasn't sustainable to do it that long yeah people would read through it Right. I mean, you could you could tell after a few years if this person is just a load of bollocks. You love it. You will be able to tell. Awesome. Great Britishism there. That's so, <laughs> excellent. Um, uh, so, uh, so I love that. So in in this YouTube space, actually, the the, the veracity, the the credibility, the honesty is the thing that actually makes you a successful storyteller. Yes, but yeah. actually, I would not to take away from your your <laughs> answer. I would. This concept of storytelling that I go through and I found through the businesses that I've launched is something called ethos, pathos, and logos. And I yeah. think a lot of people know that, right? So Bring our ethos, stuff into the room. Come on. <laughs> so ethos is yeah. just the, is the ethics where yeah. you get people to, to trust you. So that's the credentials and the cred credibility. Mm -hmm. And you could say that my earlier videos, I brought out just ethos because... I'm a medical student, so I have the rights to talk about medicine and medical school, yeah. right? Yeah. Then there is the, the pathos, which is pity. Like, how do you get your audience to feel, yeah. right? And the logos is the logic. These are factual information. Like, how do I tell you something that is factual? And the ability to combine three of them is what makes people connect to what you're saying. Mm. But you don't even have to combine. So I find that on my YouTube channel, I don't have to combine 
all three with every video because people already know that I am a doctor, right? So I don't have to turn on the camera to say, oh, listen, I'm a doctor, you know? But what am I doing? The content I'm putting out, can I genuinely say that people will connect with this story because it's my life? Yeah. And also they will feel what I'm, mm. what I'm going through because, you know, I'm showing them, talking about motherhood and the experience with, you know, postpartum complications, mm. right? But also, how do I get them? They, but they already they already trust me because of the, the length of time that I've been on the channel. So the thing that I find that misses sometimes with a lot of, you know, stories that people do not connect to is because it's missing something. You're dishing out facts at people, yeah. but how do you how do you tell them? How do you show them that listen, you can also connect to this? This is how. You yeah. do that by showing them how it could also yeah. affect them. Yeah. Not through the numbers, not through like, oh, by 2030, we're all going to die. <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, religion has been telling us we're going to die. <laughs> exactly. I exactly. have a theory about that. Yeah. So, yes. I, I, I love that you brought the Aristotle into the room because um, I think perhaps in the climate movement, we are very good at the Logos. Oh, we mm -hmm. love the Logos. Mm -hmm. It's like we have... 50 slide decks of science yeah. and facts and stats. We actually kind of like the ethos as well because it's like, these are all of my job titles. These are all of the, yeah. the uh, speeches that I've made. These are all my doctorates. So we also, but it's almost as if we're afraid of the pathos. Yeah. And if we allow any bit of emotion or storytelling or, or, re or who we are in, mm -hmm. that somehow people aren't going to trust us. Yeah. So, um, uh, 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 so Anna Jane, Talk to us about working with script writers who, of course, actually are telling stories which aren't the truth, if you will. They are, mm. they are, they, they, there may be human truths in there, there may be universal truths in there, but they're not making documentaries. They're, they're, they're creating stories, as yeah. we've done since the moment of time. How do they find dealing with the big reality of climate change? Yeah, is it? Picasso who said art is a lie that tells us the truth yeah um yeah we so we we approach everything through deep listening and so we interviewed over 100 tv and film writers to inform our playbook for screenwriting in the age of climate change um and some of the insights that we got coming out of that that really gave us a window into where screenwriters are coming from yes. one is that they were associating climate stories with apocalypse stories so in yes. their kind of mental map there wasn't a separation um so a big like a, probably the main thing we're trying to do with the playbook was to just open up the menu of possibilities yeah. and show that there's so many captivating characters and ways that you can enter into a, a story or, or include climate in your story that isn't just the apocalypse. My theory is because is that that's because apocalypse is a story we all know. It goes yeah. back to the Bible, yeah. whereas, and even in other traditions as well, whereas imagining a more positive future, we don't have a lot of models yeah. for. And so that was a big learning. Um, also, you know, I think it goes back to what you're saying. The climate movement does uh, pre present information in a very technical way, in a very scientific way, a very wonky way. And if you're a writer and that's not the language that you use and you're you know, researching a story and you get on Google and there's 500 organizations, you can't tell who's trustworthy and who isn't. And when you do end up on NASA's webpage, not to knock on NASA, I love NASA, but a lot of the climate language is still very dense. Like if I hadn't been studying this for 15 years, I would have a hard time um, so that's another thing we really try to do is translate the science and the impacts and the solutions to a language that writers and creatives can connect with. Yeah. yeah, so there's, so yeah, it's been, but I mean, I've also just learned so much from working with writers and storytellers. Mm -hmm. Another big one is that they, a lot of writers felt like they had to tell the whole climate story, yeah. you know, and like, I, maybe there's a way for Marvel to do that, but yeah. for, in the most part, there's not a way to tell yeah. the whole climate story. So we really encourage writers to start with where their fascination is or their concern is or their, you know, what they're seeing and feeling in their own lives and to kind of uncover the stories that they want to tell that way. Yeah. Um, and then the other big kind of learning is when we say we've actually moved away from the language um, climate story because we found that writers were thinking that we meant a whole different kind of story, a yeah. whole new genre, yeah. when we're not. Like we're really talking about 
uh, representing climate and acknowledging climate in any kind of story that's mm -hmm. taking place now or in the next hundred years. Yeah. And so we just did some research with USC's Media Impact Project. It's the first research on climate and scripted entertainment. The full report is coming out in October. But it shows that 2.8% of scripted entertainment between 2016 and 2020 mentioned climate or pretty much anything related to it. We, yeah. we studied 36 different keywords, which yeah. is very small. And so our goal is to get that up to 50% by 2027 of just some indication yeah. that climate exists in the story world in the same way that it exists in our lives. This is this is so true. So we did, we did something similar in the UK with BAFTA where we looked mm -hmm. at, um, at how often climate change was mentioned in non-current affairs, non-news news media. And climate change is mentioned less than zombies. It's mentioned yeah. less than cats. It's mentioned less than cake. Yeah. Um, it, it was just extraordinary. But one of the things which I took away from that was, does the story always have to be about climate change? So when I look at the youth climate movement, all these amazing young women who are dedicating that, and they are primarily women, who are dedicating their life to making this huge change, fighting this monster, overcoming it, um, so many of that I've talked to, um, a massive moment in their life was the Hunger Games mm. and reading the Hunger Games. Now, this is, Hunger Games is not a story about climate change, but it is, it is a story about young people feeling that they are being exploited by older people and overcoming that and, and rebelling against it, which, of course, is an analogy for climate change. And so um, uh, one of the things which I'm, I'm interested in is that take, take um, uh, 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 the work that, that you do. Do you feel like the best thing you could do would be to talk about climate change? Always actually telling your stories about, about uh, uh, your family, about overcoming challenges. Can, can, we, can we talk about climate change without talking about climate change? Yes, 100%. And also particularly because um, I mean, if you're not a creator, or if you do not even earn your revenue from creating, you wouldn't know that it's important to have like a niche that you're known for in the space. So are you a family creator, a fashion creator, a sustainability creator? Yeah. So you already have these silos in, you know, for the most part, you know, in, this, in the digital space. Yeah. So it, it could feel like you're um, an imposter when you yeah. feel like, oh, I'm gonna turn on my camera now and then talk about climate change. So of course, if I don't, I could talk about it without using those words, yeah. you know? And I, I also, personally as a creator, I struggled with that, yeah. you know, at the point where I realized, okay, I, I have kids now and I want this to be part of what they learn from a young age. And I want my audience to also connect with the way that I teach my children about climate change. But then I struggled with how to then talk about it on my platforms. Again, because I'm known for putting things about my, my career and my family. So does this make me a sustainability influencer? Yeah. And then I felt like, even though I am connected to it because we're all, like this is all of our responsibilities. Yeah. Like, but then there is this um, reservation of, does it mean that I'll be perceived to be branching out of the niche that everybody already yeah. knows me for, to yeah. be going to somewhere else? And how would that then affect my brand partnerships and my revenue? Yeah. That, th these are yeah. actual things that people yeah. worry about. But then through conversations, I've, also, I've just learned that there is another way to talk about it. So even if when you do the research, you don't really see the word climate change, yeah. I think that there's so many other ways to talk about it, to show how you're teaching the children about yeah. it without using the actual two words. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things which, again, perhaps the fact that climate change itself was mentioned less than zombies, mm -hmm. but if we're talking about changing our diets, if we're talk talking about insulating our homes, recycling. if we're talking about recycling, if we're talking about, um, uh, uh, about how we travel, we're talking about climate change. Like yeah. when you're talking about trying to live a better life, trying to do things, when you're talking about voting for things you care about, you're talking about climate change. So one of the things which I'm really interested in in scripted content is behaviors that we show. So we have, uh, we have product placement where companies pay to have their products shown within shows. We also have this concept of behavioral placement that um, NBC um, uh, uh, pioneered, where rather than talking about climate change, they just embedded 
people doing sustainable behaviors within shows, such as not showing people carrying water bottles, showing people walking rather than driving, making sure that in, um, in, in, in uh, outdoor shots, that all the cars who were on the road were mainly vulnerable. Is that something that you think that is being taken up in Hollywood, this idea that actually it's not just the words or the storyline, it's the world that we show and how we show what a desirable life is can itself be a climate story without mentioning the words. Yeah, certainly. We talk about it on a spectrum. So everything from showing solutions or impacts on in the background yeah. in a way that doesn't necessarily influence dialogue or certainly story, um, to when it just comes up in passing conversation um, that feels very authentic to the characters, and then to more in depth, you know, where it's a B plot line or it's it's more, and then you have projects like don't look up or first reformed or um, or you know at whole episodes where climate yeah. is a driving factor and that's kind of the most extreme and of course we want more across that spectrum but actually when it shows up more subtly like um, we know that that especially when it is actually spoken about in dialogue not necessarily the word climate change or just like some clarity that you are referring to the yeah. phenomena of living in the age of climate change yeah. it validates the audience and it says you know this character that I'm attached to also is thinking about this, is also worried about it. And that's, they call it a psychological safety net. Like we need that. We need to not feel alone and isolated before we can move to a place of action. And TV and film is exceptionally good at that yeah. because of story and yeah. because of their reach. I'm loving this, that because yeah. the YouTube world and the scripted world coming together to actually tell this new story, both in terms of the story of climate change, the behaviors, the personal journey that people are going on, which I think is so important. Um, and I know that there'll be a lot of people watching who will be going, oh, okay, story, I've been doing this wrong, I need to dump all of my facts, I need to start telling stories. <laughs> what stories am I gonna tell? Oh my God, I don't know how many stories. Um, so for all of these wonderful climate solutionists and change makers who are gonna be starting their journey to becoming better storytellers, because actually whilst we do need the amazing, wonderful, you know, millions of people watching YouTubers, and whilst we do need the script writers who are the story experts, we also need millions of people being storytellers in their daily lives mm -hmm. and actually telling their own story. Um, as an expert in that, as someone who's able to tell their own story, could you maybe close out by giving some advice to people who now want to learn how to tell their story? So I'll, I'll start with my saying, um, we tell stories every day anyway, right? You, you're even in, the, even in your house, even if you're with your flatmates or family members, the conversations that we're having, that story. So it might look bigger than it actually is. It isn't, mm -hmm. right? To become a storyteller today or tomorrow, or actually to acknowledge that you are indeed a storyteller doesn't involve you having a social media platform and having like millions of followers. You don't, you don't need a digital platform. Digital platforms are great. They get to people, but you don't need that to then be a storyteller involved in a conversation that impacts all of us on earth, right? So my advice would be, whatever you're doing in your own little way, share it with your friend, share it with your neighbor, and if that conversation goes beyond that to a, a full room and a community and a platform and, and national TV, all great. But sometimes, actually I was in the, in the goalkeepers conference a few days ago and I got a few pointers. Somebody said um, that we need little solutions to, bigger pro to big problems. That's the first one. And then number two is when we talk about climate change and everything that needs to be done, it looks so big, it sounds so big, but then whenever, when we change that conversation from a global level to a national level, to a local level, to a community level, that really, it breaks open another power that we then realize that we have, everybody has, yeah. right? So if we can think about just you as a person and your friend and your mom and dad and sister, that's the best place to start. 
I love that. And I think for so many of the people who are here and so many people who are watching online, just that validation and permission, you're already a storyteller. Yeah. You're already doing, as we heard, yeah. it's it's 65% of our conversations. Yeah. Just just actually harness the power you already have. Thank yes. you so much for that. So you work with some of the most amazing storytellers that we have, the people who tell us the stories that we all go to flock to <laughs> cinemas and see and that we all sit and watch the box set up until two o'clock in the morning going, oh, I've got to go to work tomorrow, but just one more episode. Um, that's uh, me. Yeah, yeah oh, yes. totally. 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 Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a story everyone can resonate with. Um, uh, for, for those who, who, are, who are hearing this and now want to become better storytellers, can you just tell us a couple of things which you've learned about how to, how to tell a great story? Yeah, um, I would say, I totally agree. Start, I mean, it's the same thing I tell screenwriters. Start with where you are. Like, I, I live on the Gulf Coast of Alabama. We're very threatened by climate change. So a lot of the stories that I'm most drawn to are, are rooted in the place that I love. And so I think that that's always a good place to start. I'll be really good. Oh. I'm lean in, and I'm going to do that. Thank so you. Mic, <laughs> yeah, phone, thank sorry. you. Um, and I would definitely encourage people. I feel like when I was a kid, or not a kid, a college student, when I expressed interest in climate change, they were like science, you know, like, and I kind of quickly understood that science is not my superpower. Yeah. And so I went into communications. And so if you're out there and you love art and creativity and storytelling, that is a really valuable skill set to bring to the climate movement and or just solutions, climate solutions. Mm -hmm. So please follow that path. And you can also be a great creative and uh, storyteller, even if your day job is you know, working on science. Brilliant. Um, yeah, that's, and then I, for me, the stories that always get me the most are the character driven ones. So I just love, um, I love when you're just enraptured by, I particularly love flawed characters. And there's like a neuroscience reason that we feel attracted to flawed characters. It's actually one of the questions we got asked the most when we were studying the playbook. Yeah. And it was from TV comedy writers. Because, you know, as you mentioned earlier today, a lot of movies, you kind of go on this journey, you're yeah. reborn, you learn, and you yeah. become better. In comedy, most of the, yeah. they're anti-heroes, yeah. and they're deeply flawed, and they don't ever really get better yeah. in TV comedy. Yeah. And so they were like, if we show these very deeply flawed characters who don't get better, who care about climate change, is that going to be bad for climate? Yeah. And we worked with climate psycholo uh, the climate psychologist, Dr. Britt Ray, yeah. um, to explore that issue. And she was like, no, actually, it's really important to show flawed characters because yeah. we relate to them. And we also yeah. trust them more yeah. <laughs> because we relate to them. Yeah. So, yeah, I love, you know. If, and make yourself a character. We're all characters. We all have stories, as, as evidenced by you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so, so, so yeah. very much for this. Um, in the late 90s, in my very misspent youth, I spent two years doing a master's degree in Shakespeare and a master's degree in sustainability back, back to front. I sort of thought those two things would never cross over. Mm. But if there's one thing that I learned for, that I've learned over decades working in, in climate and, and in storytelling is that you have to earn your happy ending. Mm. And I think that that's where we are right now. It, it is possible for climate change to have this happy ending, to have this positive outcome, to have this better future, but we're gonna have to go through an adventure story with ups and downs and challenges and setbacks and unexpected uh, friends that we learn um, and, uh, uh, and wonders and horrors in order to be able to get to the end of our quest and create a better future. Thank you so much for coming to this session on storytelling. Thank you so much for following along online. And I hope that you that you go forth and tell your story. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.